Okay, so I'm sorry for being late. Uh, I've had some technical difficulties. Um, so I'm just going to talk fairly briefly about our official toolkit implementation. Um, I've been doing a series of updates recently uh, for different communities. Um, so I'll start with a little bit about the context and then cover the timeline that we currently think we'll be able to manage for implementation. Um, I'll talk about our documentation model and policy statements, some of the issues that we've been thinking about uh, and uh, support for um, other institutions, uh, particularly in the UK, of course. So the context in which we are um, implementing uh, official toolkit is that we want to have as low an impact as possible on catalogers in order to be able to catch up with um, productions following COVID, etc. Um, uh, and minimal change uh, from current practice. There's also some structural issues here. We're still within the Aleph library management system, um, which is a Mark 21 system. That system's not uh, going to be replaced in, in the next couple of years. It might be replaced a year or two after that. But So we're really stuck with Mark 21 for the moment. So that's really influenced our thinking that we'd want to make this as low impact as possible in the catalogers, but not necessarily the people who manage the catalogers or prepare the documentation and training. Um, our provisional timeline is that we're currently working on our documentation. We're going to be testing that early in the new year, uh, and uh, we'll be having a review of that test. Then we'll um, develop some additional training materials, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to start training uh, in the early summer. That obviously is dependent on the outcomes from testing uh, and the review process, but that is the provisional timeline at the moment. Um, documentation, uh, we are publishing our policy statements in the toolkit, as Renata mentioned. Um, we've carried out an audit of internal policy and guidance documents, and uh, we've got a, a model for our um, documentation for the official toolkit, um, which we're now uh, implementing. And we've been examining different options for um, hosting that documentation. Um, no internal, no no decisions been taken on that yet. Um, I just wanted to give people an idea of the um, scope of this policy statement work. There are, as you can probably see from this slide, um, over 4,000, there's almost 4,500 policy statements. The policy statements uh, change over time as well, so that they're not stable, although they're more stable than they were. Um, so at the moment, we've got policy statements for over 3,600 of those um, policy, for those options and uh, so forth. And uh, we've got about 700 left to do, um, some of which will be in the next update, which is um, happening early December. This is what the policy statements look like in the toolkit. They're presented in line with uh, the appropriate option. Most of our policy statements will be against options but some will be at the pre-recording level or the recording level. Uh, and um, they tend to be very brief uh, and to, uh, and consistent. We use boilerplate to uh, ensure that policy statements have the fairly simple, consistent wording. Um, Catalogers' judgment, for example, do not apply. If it's an option, we might say, we will say it. Uh, sorry, if it's a condition, then Alan, we'll say apply if applicable. Sorry. Yeah. Alan, just just one thing. Could you speak a little louder, please? Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me better now? This is the uh, documentation model that we're working to. Um, we've got a top level document um, that provides some general guidance about the documentation 
and, and uh, some general guidance about certain things in RDE like transcription where we have a standard policy. We've uh, got some documents that are at the entity level that provide a bit of guidance about entities and um, decisions that you might want to take at pre-cataloging when you're working on something. Uh, and these also contain links to guidance documents where we've pulled together guidance on specific things. Many of these guidance documents are, are um, revisions of documents that already exist. Uh, and we're just trying to update them to um, conform to RDA terminology, etc. cetera. Um, we're going to have two application profiles. We're going to have one for bibliographic records and one for authority records. This enables the um, application profiles to act as a kind of um, index to RDE, which will help the catalogers to navigate through the toolkit. Um, and then we have uh, some documents that we're doing at the element level. We're not intending to write a document for every element, but we're writing documents for elements that are significant and elements that may cause um, issues. Um, that work is currently in progress. The main thing about the documents is that we're these element documents is that we're taking information that's currently in our workflow documents, which are published in the toolkit, and incorporating that into these documents, particularly the examples. The feedback we've had from the staff is that they value worked examples um, and examples that provide context. Um, so that's what we're trying to do, provide as many examples as possible in MARC uh, and with uh, annotations to explain what they illustrate. Um, all of the uh, documents will be um, versioned uh, so that we can keep track of which uh, release of the toolkit they represent or they're consistent with. Um, we will uh, have application profiles, as I said, to act as indexes to the supporting documentation and to the toolkit. And um, our general principle is that these supporting documents supplement the toolkit, but they don't replace it. So we're not replicating information from the toolkit in these documents. These documents um, provide guidance on our own um, practices uh, and perhaps pull together some information about a particular type of resource or a particular policy, uh, which is convenient for the catalogers to see in one place. We've got a standard template um, for consistency. We're, we feel that the um, new toolkit provides for much more consistency of application than uh, pr past practice. And so that's one of the benefits that we see. And we're taking advantage of that to try and make our documentation as consistent uh, as possible um, across different workflows. Obviously, there are um, distinctions, and we will make them where appropriate for music or for cartographic material, et cetera, for early printed resources in particular. Um, we're following a principle of sufficiency. We're recording information that is necessary. We're not trying to provide uh, guidance on every possibility. Um, we're focusing on things that will be used frequently, and we can add information later on if there are gaps that are identified in the process. Uh, and as I mentioned, worked examples are fairly key to the uh, documentation. This is just a brief example of a one of the specialist documents. We pulled together a lot of information about recording identifiers into one place just to make it simpler than to uh, try to uh, provide uh, separate um, documents containing large similar information about identifiers at um, work expression and manifestation and item level. Um, the application profiles, we see them as a navigational aid and providing a narrative for catalogers to follow uh, as they're cataloging. Um, they're an index to RDE and supporting documentation, and they will link to the RDE instructions uh, and element documents. 
Um, we're also going to tie in uh, some quality aspects. We're um, evaluating different elements on whether they would support basic functionality um, or um, sufficient functionality, uh, which would really enable people to discriminate between uh, resources or effective functionality, which enables people to navigate much more widely but, uh, to other resources in our collection or beyond the library. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so there's one for bibliographic records and one for authority records. That was just um, for simplicity of workflows within the, the library. Uh, but the element level documentation that we're writing will be uh, intent, is intended for use by authority control staff or by uh, catalogers working exclusively on bibliographic descriptions. Um, we took, we started from uh, the Aleph templates that we have to, to find the sort of basis for our uh, standard application profile. And we've also incorporated the legal deposit, the UK legal deposit library standard record uh, specification in there. Uh, and as I said, we're using MARC uh, encoding. We're noting the recording methods and vocabulary encoding schemes. And that's a illustration of the work in progress. Um, not all of this will necessarily be in the view that the catalogers uh, use on a daily basis, but the information will all be there. Um, uh, uh, Um, we're also working on configuration. Uh, changes to Mark 21 have obviously been implemented as the Mark um, RDA Mark uh, Working Group uh, uh, recommendations and, uh, and proposals were approved by the MAC committee. We're also, um, and, and that means that our Aleph and Primo validation will have been taken care of and the indexes will be um, defined Etc. Uh, and the, the display of the elements has been um, determined already. Um, we're also responsible for the RDA mark uh, mappings for the bibliographic format uh, between RDA and Mark 21. Uh, and we've uh, been updating that in, in relation to changes to Mark and to uh, changes to RDA. Um, we make extensive use of macros for catalogers, uh, and we've, uh, we're have we developing some new macros in relation to RDA, um, and we'll probably have to change some existing ones. Um, there's a number of um, issues that we've uh, been discussing in relation to our um, implementation. Uh, community resources area of the toolkit is one. Um, we're quite keen to use the elements mode of issuance and extension plan uh, because we think they really help understanding diachronic resources. But um, I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, we have had a lot of discussion around how we're going to handle relationship designators. And we've had some discussions about representative expressions. Um, so starting with relationship uh, designators, we've been in discussion uh, with the um, UCOR and with the, which is the UK Com Committee on RDA, uh, and with the Library of Congress and Programme for Cooperative Cataloging about relationship designators and how we maintain um, backwards compatibility with existing practice. We don't particularly want to change all of our relationship designators. Um, uh, and so what we're going to do is use the alternative de-verbalized labels, uh, which you can see in the element reference. And uh, uh, we will use, record these in $E as uh, we currently do. Uh, we will also record the URI for the constrained attribute in $4 in the mark uh, fields. And uh, we will know, we're going to do this at the agent uh, level, so it's quite a high level um, that we're recording this um, th th this uh, URI, um, and that's because there are no alternate labels at lower levels uh, in the toolkit. But the information about what kind of agent it is is obviously encoded in Mark anyway, so we should be able to um, 
address that in future if we ever have to convert the data directly into RDE. And as I said, we're going to be using macros for efficiency so that the catalogers don't have to uh, make these decisions that once they've chosen the uh, term that they want to use, the IRI, the IRI will be put directly into the dollar four as well. Um, the community resources area is um, something that might be unfamiliar to most of URIG members because what's in it has largely come from um, the RDE uh, appendices, which in turn largely came from AACR2. Uh, and some of the um, uh, instructions there also came from uh, RDE uh, guidance around how to structure authorised access points, for example. Um, so there are two components uh, in the community resources. There are refinements, which are RDE's instru or really instructions about how the Anglo-American community, for example, establishes uh, authorised access points and, and does various other things, but primarily authorised access points. And there's also um, vocabularies um, which might include things like the books of the Bible, terms of rank, uh, of nobility, etc., which are of uh, interest in a small number of communities, I suspect. Um, there's been quite a bit of discussion around the maintenance and development of this area. Um, and those discussions are still underway, but there seems to be a general feeling within the Anglo-American community, at least, that um, the information is best handled outside of the toolkit. And so Library of Congress and PCC, I believe, are going to look at handling it through the metadata guidance documents that they've produced. Uh, and we'll be looking at embedding the information in our own um, guidance documents as well. And that's primarily because um, it gives us more uh, control over the information uh, and makes it more flexible for us than having to wait for um, toolkit releases, for example. Uh, mode of issuance and extension plan. Um, we were thinking about this because mode of issuance has uh, changed its definition. It's become a bit narrower than it was in the existing toolkit. Um, and it simply reflects that a manifestation is issued in one or more units. And the extension plan is a categorization that reflects an intention to extend the content of a work. We think both of these elements are really useful. And we think that they are, uh, really will help with people understanding the range of different diachronic works uh, and how they're defined. And it should enable better decision making or at least more effective, more uh, quicker decision making about how things should be processed. However, we have to balance that against the impact on different uh, workflows within the library. Uh, and so that's an issue that's under discussion at the moment. And we're currently looking at how we can at least um, automate and probably implement this uh, iteratively, um, leaving sort of retrospective issues uh, to the future, but at least providing some um, uh, automated method by which these uh, values can be assigned from existing information rather than requiring the catalogers to actually do something else. That's work in progress and we haven't got a definite outcome yet. Representative expression, we definitely see the value of this, but we won't be implementing it at this point in time. Partly because of our longstanding policy around um, access points. Uh, so um, we will be publishing our policies in the toolkit. Other documentation will be made available um, either through the toolkit or other platforms. As I said, we haven't absolutely decided yet which way we're going to go on some of our documentation. I, I think that the support within the toolkit for things like the application profiles and the um, uh, docu and uh, document and, and supporting documentation uh, is not adequate really and so we're aiming to put that onto a separate platform which will probably be our uh, SharePoint and Teams platform but that again is still subject to a few 
final uh, into a final decision, um, and that would enable us to share it externally. Um, we're uh, we will be providing our training documentation when it's uh, available, and we aim to offer RDA training uh, hopefully later next year, and certainly by 2024. Um, we're currently, well, we're going to redesign our current training offer. Um, we'll be taking a blended learning approach, um, so de delivering information through our learning hub. Again, it will be heavily based around worked examples and exercises. It will be available as Zoom or Teams. And what we plan to do is to offer slots at two points during the year where people can book for external training courses. Um, from a range on a range of uh, bibliographic topics and we're expecting to have two versions of the training available one would be self-directed uh, and the other would be a taught version um, again both would probably be primarily delivered uh, online that's partly a pragmatic thing because both of our sites are undergoing a significant redevelopment at the moment and so space is at a premium um, but we would be open to face-to-face -to -face, uh, if somebody wants to host a, a training meeting or session. And that's really the end of my uh, presentation, so I'm happy to take uh, questions if, there, if there's time. I'll stop sharing. So far, we haven't received questions in the Q&A tool, but uh, we should give it uh, a couple of minutes. In the meantime, <laughs> let me <laughs> introduce you, our new RDA expert. <laughs> He's a little sick, so I have to be with him hello. today. Say hello. Hola. <laughs> Okay, if there aren't any questions, then maybe I can. Uh... Okay. Yeah, so... uh, you oh. can uh, also see the Q&A too. So if uh, one arrives, you can answer that uh, in writing through the Q&A tool. Okay, thank you. Uh, will the training programs be open to anyone? That's a question for you. Yeah, we'll be publishing uh, details on our website and they'll be open to anyone. <laughs>